about what it's like to be a vet tech at an aquarium, talk to you about my job a little bit, and give you some career tips on if you want to pursue something in veterinary medicine or in the aquarium field. Now, don't forget, we do have a number for you to text in. Any questions or comments you have, right here, 562-786-5181. So please text in your questions, and I will do my best to answer them throughout my presentation. My friend James is in here helping me out with my slides, so I'm going to have him kind of forward on, and I'll be communicating with him a little bit in case you're wondering who I'm talking to. Let's go ahead and go on to the next one. All right, at the Aquarium of the Pacific, we house over 12,000 animals. And we have a huge variety of species here, but over 900 different varieties of animals. Some animals we take care of here are threatened in the wild, they're critically endangered in some, in some situations, and we even have some that are extant, which means there's no more actually in the wild, they're only housed in institutions. With all these animals, it takes a lot of work to care for them on a daily basis. Um, as you see, not only do we have a large variety of fish from tropical waters and local temperate waters, we also have lots of different birds, like aquatic birds, like penguins, and our lorikeets are terrestrial birds. We have our marine mammals, our sea otters. Um, we have a large variety of sharks and invertebrates. We now we take care of a large group of amphibians. And then, as you see now, there's this really strange creature called a scuba diver that sometimes we interact with at the aquarium. Now, to take care of all these animals, it takes a whole team of support. Uh, we have our life support group. These guys help do the plumbing and take care of the maintenance of the exhibit. Um, we also have our water quality team. They're really important. They work with a lot of chemistry and make sure our exhibits are nice and clean and healthy for our animals. Uh, the department I'm a part of is the husbandry department. This involves our biologist and animal care team. Uh, for our marine mammals, we have our mammologist. For our bird staff, we have the aviculturists. And then for the fish and invertebrates, we have our aquarists. We, these guys are kind of like the, the owners of the animals. They work with them on a daily basis. They really get to know their diet, their appetite. They get to know their normal behaviors. And these guys are our, our eyes and ears for the veterinary staff. We work very closely with them. The, the department that I'm involved in is the veterinary staff. Uh, this is kind of like a sneak peek, but if you go back one, uh, I want you guys to text in, talk amongst yourselves for over 12,000 animals and over 900, 900 different species, how many veterinarians and vet techs do you think we need to run a facility like this and care for all the animals? Talk amongst yourselves, take a few minutes, text in what you think we have on staff here. Oh yeah, sorry. I'm gonna bring up the phone number one more time for you to text. <laughs> I thought I was getting some responses, okay. It is 562-786-5181. Take advantage of this, type in your answers, be a little interactive with our activity today. Um, at the bottom of the screen, you also see volunteers. Uh, we're very lucky here that we do have a huge staff of volunteers to come in and help us with our animals as well. I'm getting some responses. Let's see. No, I'm not. Okay, well, we'll move on. <laughs> All right, we actually, on staff for all these animals, we have three veterinarians. Dr. Lance Adams has been here for about 16 years. I'm standing in front of myself, the vet tech. Um, <laughs> then luckily, in the last couple of years, we brought on two new veterinarians, Dr. Brittany Stevens and Dr. Jamie Gerlach is our intern. Uh, she's getting some extra experience at the aquarium with us. And then I am our, currently our only veterinary technician here. A lot goes in to a lot goes into caring for the animals at the aquarium. As I said before, we have our keeper staff. They're in charge of feeding the animals, getting daily looks at them, checking them over. And the veterinary staff is more in charge of managing the, the medical health of our animals. Um, so a lot goes into actually keeping our animals healthy. Just the basics are giving them a proper nutrition. Every single animal has different dietary requirements. So we make sure that we know the animal's biological needs and come up with a diet a nutrition guideline that's safe and uh, appropriate for the different species we work with. Also, we want to make sure they have a safe exhibit. If we do any alterations or any changes with the exhibit, Dr. Adams will go up and check the exhibit to make sure everything is good to go. Like nobody can get their wing caught, nobody will 
be exposed to something unsafe. Um, enrichment is a very important part of our animals' lives. We want to make sure they're properly socialized with other animals in their species group. We want to make sure they're getting nice, challenge, challenging activities to keep their mind working and keep them exercised. Um, disease prevention, which we'll talk about a little bit more, is another big part component of animal health. And something that goes along with that is preventative medicine. Um, just like you and I will go to the doctor, go to the dentist for routine checkups, uh, our animals do that. We have routine schedule annual exams for them. And then finally, we do postmortem examination to try to get answers uh, to try to prevent things from happening in the future. Remember, everyone watching, text into this number if you have any questions or comments. Mm -hmm. uh, wow. So I'm getting a report. We had some guesses for the number of veterinarians at the aquarium. One guess was 100 veterinarians, and one guess was between 20 to 50, I believe. So great guesses, but we do not have those that many veterinarians. Might be a little more hectic. <laughs> All right, as I was talking about preventative medicine, most of our animals are scheduled for annual physical exams. Uh, so they come in once a year and we do an overall physical exam on them, get a weight, sometimes draw a blood sample. And this is a great way to really get to know the normal health values of an animal. So if they come into us later with a health concern, we're able to kind of identify what their normal is and kind of compare to that. Now, of course, with our, t our tanks with over thousands of fish, we're not going to catch up every single fish once a year to examine them. So for those instances, we rely more, of our, more on our staff to let us know if one of the fish is acting abnormal or needs to be looked at by the veterinary staff. How many animals do we have in the aquarium? Great question. We have about approximately over 12,000 animals here. All right, moving on to our next slide. Now, as hard as we try to to prevent any injuries or illnesses for our animals. Sometimes they do occur. Um, some things that can cause that are malnutrition. Animals can get injured, whether it's a bite wound or something else that happens in the exhibit. Um, animals can get parasites, especially coming in. through. We have to put them through a quarantine process to make sure they don't spread that to the rest of the animals we have on site. Um, animals can contract some kind of disease. And there's also unknown causes that we need to investigate further. Uh, it's the job of our veterinarians, as the doctors here on site, they're in charge of examining the animal, creating a diagnosis, or trying to learn what the problem is, and creating a treatment plan to make the animal feel better. Um, here are a few examples of some instances where we do have some sickness or injury. Um, so over here, which I wish, figure out which hand I can use. Here. <laughs> uh, this is a mangrove stingray. It actually had a little laceration wound or a cut from when, back when we had the sawfish in the exhibit. When she was moving her rostrum, she kind of sliced the little ray's fin, and we had to suture it closed. Um, now, first thing we do with this, the veterinarian will take a look at it and decide if it's something that can heal on its own without much, um, uh, without much intervention, or if it's something we need to go in and actually help the animal with. Um, so if you can see in the picture, it's kind of hard to see, but in a normal situation, you have a, like I say, a cat and dog on a table, and they're sterile, and they're prepped for you and they're sitting still under anesthesia. So our stingray here, you can see Dr. Adams is wearing waders and he's sitting on a bucket inside of a, a shallow pool. Um, so a lot of the times you kind of have to work with what you have and get creative in treating a lot of these aquatic animals. Um, so the stingray is under anesthesia. I'll talk about fish anesthesia a little bit later. Um, but this is something Dr. Adams sutured clothes and we put him on antibiotics and he healed up nicely. All right, I'm gonna take a quick break from this. I have a question. What is the penguin's favorite food? And do you have a favorite penguin vet story to add? All right, um, the penguin's favorite food they eat is herring and capelin. These are two types of fish. One thing really cool about these guys, is they actually swallow their fish whole. Um, so when you see the size of their beak and the size of the fish, it's very surprising that they can get that down in one big whole swallow, but it's very cool to watch. Um, they come up to the bucket and are aviculturists has them all uh, memorized by who's who, and she'll just kind of feed out fish, and someone will record for her who's eating what that day. Um, I, I think one of my favorite times of the year is our penguin annual exam time. They come down to the hospital, 
Uh, we do have to time our annual exams based on certain things. Uh, so right now the penguins are going through the breeding season. Um, so they're collecting palm fronds, which you can watch on our cameras as well. We have some live footage of that. Um, they're collecting fronds to make their nests. So they'd be really upset if we caught them right now to bring them down for examinations to the hospital. Um, they also, in the fall time, go through something called a catastrophic molt, where they just lose all their feathers at once, stop eating, and they're very uncomfortable. Um, so they would not appreciate exams during that time either. So we kind of go through the year, check and see what's going on with them, and try to time out their exams right so they don't uh, get too upset with us for catching them up for their examinations. Um, moving on, speaking more about penguins, this middle radiograph here is one of our Magellanic penguins, Jade. She's up on exhibit now. Uh, one day, Jade was limping a few years ago, so we brought her down to the hospital to take a radiograph to see what was wrong with her leg. And we actually found this. Where am I pointing? Right here, this metal bar. Um, so a little background about radiographs. When we take them, uh, we're checking the dense. We can check for calcification. So bone shows a really bright white, and so does metal. Um, so you can see her, her bones there that look normal. Then you, that little bar right there is a metal piece. That she actually it was a piece of metal that fell into the exhibit and she swallowed it and it was actually poking through her stomach and poking her leg causing her to limp um, so this is something when we have diagnostic tools like radiographs and other things at our disposable we, disposal we can uh, take radiographs and kind of diagnose and see what's going on with this animal um, luckily for jade's case we were able to use a pretty non-invasive machine called an endoscope it's a long, flexible instrument with a camera and light at the end, and you can actually put it down their mouth and go into their stomach and use little fun grabbers to grab this out so we don't have to take her to surgery. Um, and then on the other side, I'll walk over here. Um, we also are lucky that we can help with rehabilitation animals. Um, so sometimes, occasionally, we'll get green sea turtles in, uh, and usually, multiple cases, they'll have some kind of fish hook ingestion, as you can see on the radiograph here. Where am I pointing? Um, yeah, so we are a facility that does help with wild sea turtles, and we have a lot of footage on our Facebook and social media of a lot of these turtles successfully being released to the wild, which is great. All right, I have another question. Worst injury that, or illness that you had to deal with, and what kind of diseases did they get? And work history. I'll get into the work history a little bit later. Hmm, the worst injury that I had to deal with I think a lot of them, um, I think the sawfish, the one kind of like this guy here, she, before she left our facility, she caused a lot of damage to our sharks in the exhibit, not on purpose, just uh, the movement of her rostrum would kind of cut sharks um, inevitably. So I think a lot of those little wounds that we saw with her were some of the worst ones I saw. Um, what kind of diseases do animals get? Uh, we have a variety. Um, one example, a few years ago, our lorikeet flock was exposed um, to an opossum that got into the exhibit, and so they got a protozoal disease called sarcocystis. Um, so this is something that we had to be treated. Our lorikeets here, um, we had about 60 birds affected, so every single morning and night, all the birds had to be treated with a specific medication. Um, so that was quite a undertaking of treating all the animals. Move on. All right, so I talked a little bit about some of the procedures, some of the issues we see at the aquarium as far as our animal health. Um, so what is my role as a veterinary technician through these procedures and through these things that we see? Um, basically, anything and everything that can help the doctor treat these animals um, and provide them the best care. So in the pic first picture, I'm helping. I'm in high fashion in my x-ray gown. Uh, we were led to protect ourselves from the radiographs. Um, so that's me helping Dr. Adams take a radiograph of a shark that we suspected to be pregnant. Um, the middle photo is a cow nose ray. And uh, so as a vet tech, I help set up for the procedure, help and get the animal under anesthesia and help monitor the animal and help recover and then clean up after the procedure. And then on the far side, this is during our peng penguin physical exams. Um, so I help draw blood and process the blood samples to send those in the lab to get some values. Now, unfortunately, our job isn't just caring for animals all day. There's a lot more to it than that. Um, as a veterinary technician, I also kind of manage the hospital. Um, so I need to make sure that we have all of our medications, everything is running 
smoothly. The hospital looks clean because we are in display to the public. Um, so we do all of our exams and procedures we do. The, there's a big window out front so everybody can watch. We try to interpret for the guests what we're working on. I'm also a pharmacist. Uh, we have a full array of medications. We treat animals that range from a five gram seahorse up to an 800 pound sea lion. Um, so math and calculations is very important to make sure all of our animals are getting the right doses they need. Um, it's also important, just like if you had meds for your dog or cat at home, it's really important to understand the right instructions. Like, can this medication be given with food? Does it interact badly with another medication? So we need to explain all these things to the keepers to make sure the animal's getting the best care they possibly can. Um, this fun microscope, we look at that every day to look for things like parasites on our fish. Um, we can do skin scrapes, gill clips on the fish, and we can get other, lots of other samples. We can do in-house blood work to some aspect. And then, of course, very fun part of the job is very, very thorough record keeping. Um, we have a computer system. We also have treatment sheets and very detailed records to make sure every animal is accounted for and getting the proper treatment they need. All right, I have another question here. What do you do when an animal dies? Um, when this does happen, we do our best to get answers from it. Um, so I mentioned before we do post-mortem examinations. Uh, if you've heard the term autopsy, that's when an exam is performed on a person. And for animals, it's called a necropsy. Um, so we do an examination after to try to find the cause of death. So we can A, present, uh, prevent it from happening to the rest of the animals of that group, or B, just get more answers so we can kind of provide good medicine for the rest of the flock or for the rest of the group of animals we have on staff. All right, so I mentioned a few role, more roles that I have as a vet tech. Um, our veterinarians here also have a lot of other things that they have in their scope of their career. Um, they don't just come in and just see the clinical work either. Um, they're in charge of designing animal health protocols. Um, so all the animals we have on site have a specific protocol of um, their biological needs, their space needs, um, what can make them thrive. And if you really think about it, uh, a lot of veterinarians go to vet school and they study cats and dogs and they study livestock and the courses in depth, but then they don't really get much training on birds and reptiles and all these animals that we call exotic animals. Um, so they really have to do some advanced training to work with these animals. Um, they have to work, worry about human health protocols. So some animals, there's something called zoonosis, where animals can pass on diseases to humans. Um, so we want to make sure that everybody working here is protected and not getting anything from our animals. Um, education, like this here now, what we're doing right today, uh, Dr. Adams and the vet team and myself, we all work on talking to the guests about what we're doing with their animals. We try to turn everything into an educating moment. Um, clinical care is what we talked about previously. Um, Post-mortem exam and then research is a really great part of it as well. A lot of these animals um, we're working with haven't been studied too much. So if we're able to help out in research to understand the animal populations out in the wild a little bit better, it's a great way to contribute to the field. All right, I have another question. How do you give medicine to a lorikeet? And how do you make sure you got all of them? Um, so some lorikeets are, there we go, there's a picture right there, it's perfect. Um, our lorikeets are nectar eaters, and so they actually eat a liquid-based nectar diet for breakfast and dinner, and their lunch is composed of a fruit smoothie. Um, so a lot of our birds were able to I say trick them, but we're able to put their medication in their nectar. We give them like a really concentrated nectar that's extra sweet, and usually they lick it right up and take it really easily. Um, some of our lorikeets are onto us, and they know that we're sneaking meds into their food. Uh, so we actually do have to catch them up like you see above and um, administer medication to them. They're pretty easy. They have their paddle tongue. They lick it up, and you can tell that it's not going in their trachea, which could cause them to have further health issues, so they lick it up and you can see nicely. Um, other species of birds, sometimes you actually have to put it past their trachea opening into their crop to make sure they're getting the medication. And how do I know that we've got all, they get all the meds? We uh, If it's a group, we um, kind of medicate their the group nectar as a whole. Uh, twice a year we actually deworm the lorikeet flocks. So that's something we do. We close down the exhibit and uh, put the medication in dose per bird to make sure everybody eats that day. Um, so I'm going to go a little bit over our day-to-day -day schedule in the hospital. Uh, the first thing we do is come in 
uh, first thing, I check on any critical animals, like any critical patients we have, and make sure they did well overnight and they're stable. Um, we have a little calendar that lists all the treatments and things that we have. So we do morning rounds, check on everybody, go over the treatments for the day. Um, the veterinary department will meet in the morning. So we'll go over our plan for the day, go over the schedule, go over any upcoming procedures and what, how we need to prepare for them. Um, we then um, will kind of schedule out, we have to work with the keepers. They have feeding schedules, they have time they have to dive, there's educational programs. So we need to kind of work around all that and make sure we can fit in specific exams and procedures. And then aside from that, we'll see any new cases or emergencies that arise throughout the day. In between all these things, we're doing educational programs, uh, restocking the hospital, maintaining the hospital, and doing any other important things needed to keep it running. All right. What is our oldest animal? Um, I think currently our harbor seals are some of our older animals. Um, Ellie, I think, is about 30 years old. And uh, that is something to think about when uh, working with the animal collection. We're, we just had our 20-year anniversary, um, so a lot of our animals are getting kind of older um, on site. We Last year, we actually um, had Charlie and Brooke, two of the oldest sea otters under human care, um, pass away at the age 21 and 22, um, which is pretty impressive. That is a part of um, veterinary medicine is dealing with these animals that have various lifespans. Um, so some, some of our animals, unfortunately, have a lifespan of like two to four years old, which is a lot younger, and then some of our other ones live up to um, 30 or so, but just kind of as they get older, you have to start managing um, geriatric things like uh, joint pain or um, uh, other, uh, sorry, yeah, eye issues, especially with pinnipeds. And we actually, in January, just had our first cataract surgery on one of our harbor seals, Shelby. Um, so we had a special special ophthalmologist and someone to come help us monitor anesthesia flying from Florida and help us with the surgery, which is pretty amazing. And Shelby is doing great. She's back behind the scenes on exhibit and she's opening her eyes every day. And she can actually, for a long time, she wasn't able to see the, the visual cues that her trainers would give her for, um, for behaviors. And actually she can see really well now and she can catch the fish like she used to be able to do. So it's pretty cool, works out well. All right, where do we do all of this medicine? Um, some of it is done in our Molina Animal Care Center. Um, so this is a veterinary hospital that was built back in 2010. It's a fully functioning veterinary hospital and it's an amazing space for us to work on our animals. Um, we have our main treatment room, like I said, is open to the public. And we have a surgery suite that we can do more advanced surgeries and procedures in. Um, we also have some holding space, some cages and tanks uh, to use for hospitalized patients. Um, so in some aspects, it doesn't really make as much sense to bring the animals to the hospital. Um, some animals are too, like Parker or sea lion, it's a little difficult to bring an 800 pound sea lion to the hospital whenever he needs a checkup. Um, so a lot of our equipment is actually portable and we can bring it up to the exhibit or to the animal. Um, so we'll do a lot of exams and treatments tank side or up at the exhibit. This is a very old photo. of. <laughs> our surgery suite. And that is one of our sea otters. Um, we actually do annual physicals and some of our sea otters we do twice a year physicals to clean their teeth, get blood work and do a full physical exam. So as you can see in this picture, uh, this is behind the scenes of our shark lagoon exhibit. So we have a little husbandry pool that we can close the gate off to and do a lot of exams in there. Um, and then this is another old photo of Dr. Adams with one of our intact male sea lions. All right, I threw this random slide in here because I'm sure everybody is texting Dave right now. What is, how do you anesthetize a fish? If you have more questions, don't forget to text in 562-786-5181. <laughs> Of course. All right. I like to say our fish and our sharks are very splashy and flashy. So we have to anesthetize them a lot of the time to make it less stressful for them, more safe for them and for us. Um, so how we do that, we have a medication called tricane methosulfonate. 
or MS222 for short. Um, and kind of like the air breathing animals that we anesthetize with these guys, they breathe in the, um, the gas anesthesia and they slowly go to sleep as it hits their vasculature system or their veins. So for fish, since they breathe water instead of air, that's how they get their oxygen. We put a powder into the water and they breathe it in, um, goes into their system and they slowly start to fall asleep. And what nobody wants to see, except for under anesthesia, the fish goes belly up once they fall asleep and we're actually able to um, work on them. So for the procedure, um, you can see here, this is our anesthesia water. So we'll put the fish in there, they'll go to sleep, and then we can actually take them out of the water and put them on this, um, this circuit system with a pump. The, the pump pumps the water over their mouth and over their gills, and that's basically breathing for them. So as long as they're on that pump system and we're having that fresh water flow over their gills, they're able to stay under anesthesia. Uh, my record for the longest surgery is now six hours on an eel uh, under anesthesia and it recovered really well. Um, just like for other types of anesthesia as well, you can check the depth of the fish or the shark or the ray you're working on. Um, so you can see if they've stopped breathing or they're not reactive at all, they might be too deep. You need to add some of their fresh tank water. Um, alternatively, if they're reacting still, and they're not sleepy enough for whatever we're doing for them, you can actually add more anesthesia to the water um, and make them at a better plane of anesthesia for the surgery or procedure we're gonna work on. Um, once we're done, we put them back in fresh water without any anesthesia, and we keep pumping water for them until they're breathing consistently, and they slowly start to wake up. Um, we always make sure they're healthy and uh, fully awake before putting them back on exhibit or put them in a holding system for a while so they're not injured. Um, so we have this, this setup that we built at the aquarium for medium-sized fish and like some of our rays, some of our smaller sharks. And then we also have a smaller system that we use. Um, so you can see this is a little pallet tang. Um, we're doing topical treatments on them once a week. So this is a smaller setup and we can do a really big setup for our really big sharks too. Just got a really fun question. Is it, <laughs> is it hard to help an animal give birth? Um, it can be, it depends on the situation. Um, a lot of our animals give birth naturally and we don't have to add a kind of help out or give assistance with them. Um, but if an animal is having trouble, it is called dystocia, having trouble giving birth. So some, in some aspects we have helped fish uh, strip their eggs. Um, we've had to kind of help a snake give, uh, she, there was no male snake in with her so they were infertile eggs, but the eggs weren't moving along as quickly as they should. So we had to assist her by giving fluids and kind of help hydrate her to pass those along. Um, so a lot of our animals successfully give birth on their own, but sometimes we do have to step in and help out. Biggest animal we've done surgery on, Biggest animal we've done surgery on was our question, thank you. I'll well, answer, I'm gonna hold up the number so we can get more questions. Um, our biggest animal was Chase, one of our sea lions. We neutered him last year. Um, so I think he was about 126 kilograms at the time, um, or almost 300 pounds. Um, and we do, we have four male sea lions in our exhibit. So we actually keep one male intact and he develops that sagittal crest that you see. I was pointing at my head, I don't have one right there. <laughs> and then uh, we neuter the other males on exhibit for aggression reasons. Um, and then they don't actually get as large or develop that sagittal crest. All right, I got a question earlier about my work history. Um, so I'm talk a little bit about my education first. Um, after high school, I went on to the University of Georgia, go dogs, had to say that. Um, I got my bachelor's degree in biology and ecology with a focus on marine biology. I was able to do a lot of courses there about um, ichthyology, which is study of fish, like a lot of marine mammal courses and some good study abroad opportunities around the ocean. Um, after that, I went on a few years later and got my license as a registered veterinary technician. Um, this is some advanced training you do as a vet tech and can open up more opportunities for you and uh, it allows you to do more advanced work as a vet tech legally. Um, and then of course through the aquarium and through various jobs I'm able to do a lot of continuing education which is great. Uh, going to conferences, going to lectures, doing online lectures. Uh, you just want to always keep learning and always keep advancing yourself. Um, okay, for, I'd say as equally as important as education and getting really good grades and having really competitive 
um, education background experience is very important as well. Um, I started out in college volunteering at the Georgia Aquarium. Um, I would just go in and help out like interpret exhibits and I would do um, greeting the guests, worked in the water quality lab. Um, and then after that, I did a few internships like at the Vancouver Aquarium with Marine Mammal Training and the Marine Mammal Care Center here in San Pedro, working with these elephant seals, wrong hand, um, some rehab seals and sea lions that you uh, get through the rehabilitation process and later on release. Um, from there, I was able to get a volunteer position here at the aquarium with the marine mammals. Um, I kind of shifted. I wanted to be a marine mammal trainer and realized uh, that the medical aspect was a lot more interesting to me. Um, so I kind of shifted and got a job as a vet tech. And then eventually, after years and years of volunteering and uh, showing up twice a week and really getting to know people and networking, I was offered a job as a vet tech here. Um, so I've been, hire I've been staff here for about five years and started volunteering here back in 2010. Here's some more pictures. This is, one of, this is I think, Troy, one of our seals here. Um, we have had the opportunity to bring some of our animals back to my old animal hospital where we have a CT scanner. Um, so we brought an opossum and a penguin back up there for CT scans. And then this looks like an aquarium animal, but it's actually a dog. <laughs> in the middle. Um, <laughs> so I would say for career advice, education is very important. Uh, whether you want to go the vet tech route at a zoo or aquarium, or if you want to go into vet school, it's very, very competitive. Um, so make good grades and advancing yourself and learning as much as you can is going to benefit you in the long run. Um, experience is also very important. Anywhere you can volunteer to get experience with animals, education, um, wildlife facility, a um, Rescue center, anywhere is great. And especially getting uh, paid work experience is very valuable if possible. And of course, networking is huge. Uh, getting to know people in the field, um, A, they're gonna help you, help guide you and give you advice on the career. And also they're going to be there to write you a letter of recommendation, which is very important for lots of jobs you wanna get. That is all for now. I don't wanna stand in front of the penguin. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in and please, We'll be here a little while longer, so please send in any more questions to this number that you might have, 562-786-5181. Thank you all so much. That's nice, Becca.